Welcome everybody to the Monday, January 9, 2006 regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Will the town clerk call the roll please? Chairman Bagger. Present. Councilor Hill. Present. Councilor Fritz. Councilor Lynch. Present. Councilor McKenney. Present. Councilor Moles. Present. Councilor Swift. Here. Councillor Fritz. Here. <laughs> Everyone is fully present and accounted for. Carol, we'll wait for you to take off your coat, but don't sit down because we're going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilor Swift Kayata, I do miss my view of the flag from down there. <laughs> Up close and personal. Um, minutes of the town council meeting held on December 12, 2005. Move to accept approval. Uh, motion, Councilor Lynch. Second, Second. Councilor Swift Kayata. Um, are there any comments on the minutes, suggestions for changes? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? The minutes are approved, seven in favor, zero opposed. Um, reports and correspondence. Councilor Mills. Uh, I apologize for rushing in at the last minute. I was photocopying a, a letter from a resident and my copy machine took longer than I expect to warm up. Thank you. Uh, very, very briefly, I just wanted to mention this and uh, see if we could. I've discussed this with the uh, town manager. We might want to bring this up next month. Uh, in this past year's session, we made some changes to the ordinances that dealt with moorings. And all those people that had moorings in Cape Elizabeth that usually went June, well, they paid June to June. Then we changed the mooring time frame to be a calendar year instead. Well, I've gotten some complaints from citizens that said, hey, what about the six months that we've already paid for this year, where now we're being asked to, to pay again on January 1? Do we get six months credit towards next year's bill? Or do we want to move the, you know, have the increase in the mooring fee be okay, but um, adjust when the mooring fees are assessed and what the time frame is? And you have here in front of you some correspondence to read later on. Uh, one from the police department to a particular resident, and then this, a letter uh, from the harbor master to that same resident that are in complete conflict with each other. So I would ask you if you can, between now and the next meeting, to read these over, and I'll discuss with the chairman. Perhaps we can bring up a request to make a, uh, to discuss this at the next meeting, what we can do to help those residents out that are caught uh, in this, this problem of having either overpaid or having the calendar adjusted for their mooring fees. Thank you, Councilor Moles. Anything else, reports and correspondence? Town Manager's report. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of items I want to talk about briefly. Uh, one is, is I get an awful lot of questions about the lot that's in back of the uh, council chamber here, 316 Ocean House Road, what's the status of it? Uh, just to recall, the town sold it uh, about a year ago to uh, Paul Woods, uh, I don't know, maybe it was some corporate name, but uh, uh, to a local resident, uh, Paul Woods. And uh, then he went to the planning board and there was, there was an office building proposed to go there. Uh, part of the original uh, purchase and sale agreement with the town uh, provided that all of the site work uh, contained on the site plan must be substantially complete by December 31, 2006. 
Uh, so that is still, you know, the operative uh, language, and uh, you know, I would hope that uh, you know we begin to see some action there in the spring, uh, with an eye toward uh, having that deadline met. So, uh, if you do get questions about the lot, that's that's the answer is uh, that the original uh, sale uh, was uh, conditioned upon. Uh, there being substantial completion of the site by December 31. If anyone wants me to get out copies of that again, I'd be happy to share it with you as well. Uh, secondly, there's been a number of articles, particularly in the out-of-town uh, news weeklies, uh, not in the Cape Elizabeth ones, about the police contract. And uh, Councillor Swift Piatter, I know, had some questions, and there's a packet on the back table here that uh, answers her uh, different questions about the police contract. Uh, you know, as it relates to some of what's, what's been set out there. But I want to talk specifically about a couple of things, and, you know, the more detailed responses are, are, in, the, uh, are in the response to her questions. Uh, you know, a couple of different things. First of all, you know, reading some of the newspapers, I think citizens would generally assume that there's been these contentious sessions that we've had lately, uh, you know, fighting each other over the police contract. The reality is, is we haven't actually had a negotiating session since August 5th. Uh, the, we did have a mediation on, on October 11th, uh, you know, so that's, that's almost three months ago. That was the last time we actually met uh, formally with the police union was on October 11th. I did have a, a meeting at the, at the office of their attorney on the day before Thanksgiving, and their attorney agreed coming out of that meeting that he would seek a meeting with the union, and then they'd get back to us. And to my knowledge, he's never met with the union since. Uh, you know, they have had a few phone calls apparently back and forth, or at least some voicemails back and forth. But to my knowledge, Mr. McKinley, the attorney for the union, has not met with the union as he indicated he would on the day after Thanksgiving. So all of this in the newspapers about all these contentious meetings, uh, uh, you know, they, they really haven't been happening. So I'm a little bit uh, curious about that. Secondly, uh, the uh, police union president has said in a number of places, that uh, the town's wasting money on lawyers and mediators. And I, I think we, we need to look at the facts actually on that. Uh, at every single negotiating session we've had, and they're all detailed in, in the material, the police union has been represented by William McKinley of Pro Heisler. At every one of those mediation sessions, uh, excuse me, every one of the bargaining sessions, as well as the mediation session, as well as the arbitration session that we had on a matter that the police union brought against the town, the town has had absolutely no legal representation. Uh, we have not spent one penny on legal uh, representation up to this point, when at the same time the union has had legal representation at every single meeting. So where the union, how they're saying we're wasting money on lawyers and arbitration, I, I just have difficulty reaching that same conclusion. Uh, as the union does. You know, obviously, some of you may have read in, in some of the news weeklies that we're now going to use an attorney, as I explained in the answers to Constable Swift Kayata. Uh, the reason for that is that in one of the voicemails, there's a number of reasons which are explained there, but one of the principal reasons is, is that Mr. McKinley did leave me a voicemail saying that the union probably would want to move to fact-finding. And in the, the 15 years that, you know, the, excuse me, about the 15 labor contracts that I've worked with with the Teamsters Union here in town as well as the Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent Association, we've never gone to fact-finding. So I actually have no experience in fact-finding and I, I feel it would be, you know, a real disadvantage to the town, particularly when there's contention for the town not to be represented by proper legal counsel. So even though we haven't expended any monies to date, I think it's important that the, that the, that viewpoint be represented. Some of the articles also indicated that the police union felt that I wasn't doing a good job because I wasn't advocating for the union. In you know, collective bargaining, there's a union side, there's a management side. You know, if management side is not supposed to be represented by attorneys, and the person who is representing management side is supposed to be an advocate for the union, I'm not sure where that leaves the management side. Uh, so again, you know, I think it's important that the town be represented by counsel and I'm, I'm really pleased that Linda McGill uh, will be doing that. It, you know, it remains that, you know, there's, there's a, if you look back at the contract, though, the issues that really come forward is that everyone agrees that it's important that we have, uh, we have benefits and pay in place that are competitive and that uh, enable us particularly 
to be able to uh, re retain employees as well as to recruit employees. To that end, we've provided all sorts of comparable data to the Council. We've made it available to the police union. It's available as well in the packet, all of the material and the comparable wages. And that shows that you know, we, are, we are competitive, that our wages are competitive. Nonetheless, though, we do realize that there are some, some issues, one of which is you know, retirement. And for that reason, the town council has authorized a 42% increase over the two-year proposed contract in the amount being contributed to retirement through the, the 401 style plan. Uh, it's an increase of 7% to 8% in the first year of the contract and 10% in the second year. That would not need, didn't need to match the first seven, but not the full 10. But again, it's a 42% increase. Uh, and, and as well, the whole package of uh, two-year contract is about a 10.4% increase over the two years the town has, uh, has agreed uh, you know, up to this point to provide to the members of, of the union. Uh, you know, aside from that, you know, I could go in, you know, I've, I've stated the reasons why, uh, you know, the, it's not the proper time to move into back into the mainstay retirement system. You know, the union, we withdrew from it uh, in the early 90s. That was something the union agreed to. Uh, you know, they, they weren't coerced to do it. They weren't bullied to do it. It was something the union agreed to. And now they're trying to reverse that. They have the right to do that under collective bargaining. I respect, I respect they have that right. But there's just an agreement as to the, the trends, the way they're going. Uh, you know, I recently saw there was an article about IBM. The Washington Post reported uh, that there were 114,000 defined benefit, where the benefit was set plans in the United States about 20 years ago, and now it's down to 29,000, from 114,000 down to 29,000. And you know, they even referred to it as an accelerating trend. And yet there are some who say there isn't a trend. They cite the city of Westbrook, who after a three-year uh, labor dispute uh, did adopt uh, with some different provisions than the union here is proposing, but did propose going back into uh, the retirement plan. But I could go into a lot of details, but those are the issues. But I'd really encourage anyone who's interested in this, who's read the articles, to read the material that we've distributed. We have the backup on all of the different information that's provided, all that the town's offered. You know, there are no secrets in this. And just to conclude, there's, there's one, you know, slight area that, you know, I've been criticized for that, you know, I want to talk about for just one second. And that's that I refuse to sign some sort of ground rules uh, at the collective bargaining session. The, the rea that is true. I, I did sign them. But through all the 15 years of collective bargaining, 15 contracts, I want to keep saying 15 years, 15 contracts, uh, we've never signed those ground rules. You know, this, this is not something new. At the very first meeting, the union representative puts in front of you a set of ground rules and say, sign this. The reason I don't sign it is the major provision in those ground rules is that we're not allowed to say anything about the contracts. My experience has been looking at other communities is that the union side, somehow it all leaks out. I'm not saying the union here was going to do it, but it, it leaks out anyway, and management's hands are tied. And you know, in, in this case, you know, it's obvious. You know, we're trying not to negotiate through the press. You know, I'm using this forum to talk, but I haven't been using you know, every call from every reporter. While well, the unions tended to do that. So you know, to be arguing that you know, somehow you know, we're doing something odd without, ground, without the ground rules, I, I, I just have trouble you know, following that logic. Uh, you know, I believe that you know, management, we work for all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. You know, I'm the representative of the council at the talks. I think, you know, while we don't want to, you know, every little issue doesn't need to be debated out in public, I don't think our hands ought to be tied in terms of telling the public what the issues are in, 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 you know, in general terms, if not specific terms, as, as we're giving tonight, so that, you know, the citizens don't know what the issues are. So that's why the ground rules aren't signed. You know, and despite the criticism, you know, unless specifically instructed to do so, I don't think I'd ever sign them in the future, uh, because I think it is important that that the citizens do know what's going on and that we get the word out. So that's an overview uh, of the issues in the police contract. But there's a lot more specifics and a lot of the other questions and comments that have been made are in fact answered in the packet of information. Not only the questions, but also backup information to support uh, what I've just said as well as what I've said in the memo. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that for a few minutes and that concludes my report.
Thank you for that excellent summary. That was very informative. If, if I could just interject, I just wanted to thank Mike. I was the one who brought up those questions and sent them to him, and I thought they were very complete answers, and I really appreciate sort of having the facts laid out because it has been a rather protracted process, so thank you. Yeah, and thank you to Councilor swift Kayata for taking the time to formulate those questions. That was very helpful. You're welcome. David? I also, I just want to thank Mike because I think he has carried out very well the collective directions of the council. And I say collective in the sense that we've discussed the contract in executive session as we're entitled to under the law. Michael understands where the majority of the council is and he has carried out, I think to a T, the negotiating position and that the council has. So I just want to make sure that you're not hanging out there alone, Mike. I'll hang right there with you because I think you have very ably represented the town on this. And it's unfortunate where we are, but sometimes two parties don't agree. And we, the great thing is we don't have to agree. The union doesn't have to agree with us. We don't have to agree with the union. But I appreciate your efforts, and I think you've been the target of a lot of criticism. And I just want you to know you're not alone. You're doing what we've asked you to do, and I just want the record to be very clear about that. So thank you. Thank you for that, Councilor Lynch. Anybody else? Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. If there are any citizens who would like to address the council on any subjects that are not on tonight's agenda, now is your opportunity to do so. There will be another opportunity at the end of the meeting. Seeing no one, we will move on to the first agenda item, which is item 32-2006, Winnick Woods Master Plan Public Hearing. And the council will hold a public hearing on the proposed Winnick Woods draft master plan that was presented to us by the Conservation Commission. And last, last month, when did we have our workshop? Is it December? Yes. Yes. A while ago. Thank you. A while ago. Last year. Sometime <laughs> at the very end of last calendar year, I believe, in December, maybe November. Um, the council did hold a workshop with the Conservation Commission um, where the details of the proposed master plan were presented to us. So the public hearing is now open. And anyone who would like to address the council on matters related to the Winnick Woods draft master plan is welcome to do so. Anyone? Folks are here for that. Anyone from the Conservation Commission who would like to address this at all? Not obligated to, Mr. Herrick. However, you're welcome to. My name is John Herrick. I'm chairman of the Conservation Commission, at least for tonight. Tomorrow night, I won't be. Um, I apologize for my voice. I have laryngitis, um, and, it's, and you may not be able to hear me clearly. Very sorry for that. So I'll be very, very brief. Um, as you know, we, we spent quite a bit of time working on this master plan uh, using uh, Linda Francis Scone, who was the next member of the Conservation Commission, who drew this plan up well, with our assistance uh, two or three years, maybe three or four years ago. We made a lot of trips over there. We've worked with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, with the adjacent, uh, who own several acres of, of land just adjacent to the Winnick Woods. Um, and we've developed, trying to, we're trying to develop a plan to maintain some habitat there for some of the species. And in this particular case, the New England Cottontail, and we've discussed that at the workshop that we had with you on December 12th, if I remember correctly. Um, then we've, uh, we've, we've discussed at some length with uh, Bruce Moore and Jan Chapman, who are here uh, in the audience, about the relocation of the entrance 
to Winnick Woods, or a little bit further away, from about 100 feet away from the present entrance. We think that's to the best interest, not only for them, but for the town. And we do plan to, and they have very generously agreed to uh, subsidize and finance the cost of that relocation. And we think that's, uh, that's very commendable. We think that the plan as presented um, will require some work on our part, will require some maintenance, particularly in the regenerating fields. We'll have to develop new trails. We'll have to do a lot of signage. There's some boardwalking that must be done, uh, one, well, at least one bridge. We're working um, uh, with Jay Cox in, in relocating one of the trails that goes into uh, his area. Uh, we want to make sure they still connect up to the land trust um, trails that, are, that, that exist there. So we've spent quite a bit of time working on this plan. Um, we think it is, um, we hopefully, we hope that it is a good plan from your point of view, and we do hope that you will uh, approve this plan. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you, if you have them. Any questions for Mr. Herrick? Thank you, Mr. Herrick. Uh, Maureen, anything from the town planner? Anyone else who would like to speak on the matter of the Winnick Woods Master Plan? Seeing no one? Oh, yes. Please give us your name and address, please. Yes, um, my name is Janice Chapman, and I live at 1108 Sawyer Road, which is adjacent to the entrance to the, to the Winnick Woods property, the planned um, trails. And I just want to say that we had, Bruce and I had some concerns originally with the original plan, and we have, um, it's been a pleasure to work with the Conservation Commission and with Maureen um, to make some changes in that original plan, and uh, we're very happy with the, the changes that have been made and hope that the uh, plan will be approved by the Council. Good. Thank you, Ms. Chapman. Anyone else? Then that concludes the public hearing. May I have a motion? Councilor Fritz? I would move uh, approval of the plan, the master plan for Winnick Wood. Second. Presented in the September. <laughs> motion, Councilor Fritz. Second, Councilor Moles. Discussion on the motion? Councilor Moles? I would just like to echo the uh, comments that have already been made. What a great job the Conservation Commission's done looking at this. And, you know, great thanks to uh, Mrs. Larea and, and for donating this piece of land for this usage so that it could remain open space as it is. Uh, and for those that don't know, we, from my understanding, uh, Winnick is her original family name. Uh, which is why these woods, this plan, instead of being just named the Larea Parcel, is being renamed as the Winnick Woods uh, site. Uh, you know, we don't get too many opportunities to really thank people, and a lot of work went into this document, so I wanted to thank uh, John Herrick, the rest of the Conservation Commission, which is Carol Haas, Julie Franklin, Mike Duddy, Mike Pulsifer, Jonah Rosenfeld, David Sterling, of course, our own Maureen O'Mara, but also Linda Francis Scone, a student who also helped in putting this together. So I just wanted to thank you all for, for putting together this great plan for Winnick Woods and helping to save the New England cottontail. Councilor Lynch. I have a, a question um, for, I guess, the manager I'll direct it to. He might have to redirect it, but if you recall at our workshop, I had some questions about the legal implications of designating some portion of the parcel as endangered species habitat, and to what extent any kind of formal designation would restrict human activity on, on the parcel. Um, I don't, we have not received any information back on that, so I guess I have two questions. Um, it's my understanding if we adopt the plan, which I think is great in all respects, and I'm supportive of it, but I'd like to see the information. If we adopt the plan, we are not taking any action tonight on endangered habitat designation 
and that, in fact, it would require some subsequent council action to move forward. So those are my questions to you. Through, through you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, that is my understanding, that you're adopting a master plan and that any arrangement with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or any other agency that would officially designate area as uh, habitat for the New England cottontail uh, would require future, future council action. Okay. Well, with that, I support it. I, I might even support a habitat designation at some point in the future, but I do feel that we need additional information before we could take that step. So, thank you. Other comments? All those in favor of the motion to approve the draft master plan? Motion is approved, seven in favor, zero opposed. Thank you, Mr. Herrick, to you, and I echo Councilor Moll's thanks to not only you, but to the rest of the Conservation Commission for a job very well done. Um, and thanks to um, Mrs. Lorea and her family for a donation of 57 beautiful acres that will forever be conserved and preserved in the town of Cape Elizabeth. So, thank you. And um, also, as to Linda Franciscone, who isn't, doesn't live in town anymore, Linda was a neighbor of mine. Mm -hmm. um, she's been referred to as a student. Linda was, it's a little bit of a misnomer, Linda was actually a lawyer who went back to school to get a degree in landscape architecture. And it was part of this, um, part of her um, retraining to get a degree as a, I, I believe it was a master's degree in landscape architecture. Um, that she took on uh, this project, and it was excellent. And unfortunately, Linda has left Cape Elizabeth. She and her family moved to uh, Texas, which was Texas's gain and Cape Elizabeth's loss. But thanks to her for all the work she did. Next item on our agenda is item number 33-2006. A proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance uh, bisected lots. And may I have a motion? I'll make a motion that the proposed amendment change to uh, the zoning uh, that is set forth in our council packets be referred to the ordinance committee. Second. We have a motion and second to refer it to our newly constituted or ordinance committee, which is Councilor Fritz as chair. Um, with Councilors Dill and Lynch. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? The motion is approved, seven in favor, zero opposed. Next item, number 34-2006, um, 16 Beacon Lane Consent Agreement. Um, Mr. McGovern, would you like to present this? Yes, uh, thank you. This uh, attempts to correct an error that was made in uh, the year 2000. Uh, the then owner of the property, who's not the current owner of the property, uh, put on a second floor addition and it by approximately two feet did not meet the setback requirement. The plan showed one piece. Uh, the actual, you know, there was more recently a, uh, a title survey done. Uh, for someone that the prospective owner that showed uh, that it didn't meet the setback. Unfortunately, the, the, the way the zoning ordinance is constructed is that the language that's in the zoning ordinance that uh, uh, the standards that they look at for a variance, but this would not meet those standards. So unfortunately, the board, we've dealt with these a couple of times, would have no choice uh, other than to deny it, and then it would come to the council. Uh, there is a, there's a property owner waiting to purchase this house. There's a buyer waiting to sell this house. Uh, what I'd propose is a consent agreement that would be drafted by the town attorney at the expense of the current owner of the property uh, that, that would uh, clear away this problem, eliminate, thereby eliminating the violation, giving clear title to the property, uh, again, with the seller paying for the cost of that. There'd be no specific fine. None of the parties involved at this point in time were a party to the original problems that occurred back in the year 2000. Are you going to make a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've had 
uh, financial dealings with one of the parties to this uh, property on this specific property in the past, and I would ask that the council gives me permission to recuse myself from this particular vote. So moved. Second. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion to accept Councilor Moll's request for recusal? Six in favor? Zero opposed, Mr. Councilor Moll's abstaining. Okay, can I make a motion now? Councilor Lynch. I would move that we authorize the town manager to sign a consent agreement permitting an existing second floor to remain as it is at 16 Beacon Lane. Second the motion. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Fritz. Um, I'm, I'm going to support the motion, but um, I am concerned that, you know, something was approved in the past, um, and it, it, it doesn't seem like a good idea to approve. I, I'd like to know why the two feet that go beyond the setback requirement would have been approved for, this, say, the certificate of occupancy back in 2000. Is there something that we need to change in the ordinances um, in terms of information that's provided to, to not have that happen again? My, my suggestion would be when the ordinance committee next meet, they invite uh, the code enforcement officer to come in and have a dialogue mm -hmm. on that and how it can possibly be avoided. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to note, following up on that, that, you know, there's the suggestion that, you know, until this time, nobody knew about the violation. Um, however, you know, in our packet, we've been provided with a, um, a survey that was done at the time of the sale from, I guess, the previous owner, Maureen York, to the current owners, Stephen and Amy Sullivan. And if I'm reading this correctly, this does show an encroachment. It shows the distance from the house to the right of way being 23.6 feet, mm -hmm. um, a foot and a half in violation. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it looks like the current owners were put on notice of the violation when they bought the property. Yeah, I, I agree that it, it does say 23, six feet, 0.6 feet, but I, but I don't think it does with the current, you know, the current owner of the property comes in and buys it. They didn't know what the setback was. Uh, you know, just no one questioned it at the time. And, you know, the, the, the new buyer uh, in looking for title insurance, uh, that the new title insurance company asked the question, whereas the previous, does that meet the setback? And lo and behold, it didn't. Councilor Swift, get out. I guess I was just assuming that this was a mistake. It was just an error that nobody picked up, and now we're just trying to correct it so that none of the parties are hurt. And I agree it should be reviewed at the Ordinance Committee, but I, I don't think there's really, I just think it was a goof up. That was how I interpreted the information we received. And I interpret it the same way. I think that's exactly what it was. Um, from the time the addition was added on until today, there was a mistake made, nobody picked it up, and now it's been caught. I think that's exactly right. Further comments? All those in favor? The motion is approved, six in favor, zero opposed, one abstention. Well, actually not an abstention. Mr. <coughs> Councilor Moles was recused. Um, next item is item number 35-2006, personnel code amendments. Um, this item was placed on our agenda for this evening um, as a follow-up to um, amendments that were made to the personnel code last month. Um, the staff, however, has recommended um, that this be tabled until our next month's meeting 
because the town's legal counsel is reviewing the personnel code in its broader sense, correct? That's correct. So do we have a motion to I table? I move that we table item 35206, personnel code amendments, until such time as the town's legal counsel has given us feedback on <coughs> full code that he's looking at. If that's next month, great. If not, when he's done. She. She. Sorry. <coughs> we have another town attorney that is a he. I'll second that motion. Discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Motion is approved. Seven in favor. Zero opposed. Next item, number 36-2006, an update of Spurwink Church regulations and fees. Deborah Lane. Assistant Town Manager Deborah Lane. Good evening. First off, I'd like to start by thanking Janet Hannigan. Um, for those of you that don't know Janet, she is our church greeter. Janet is actually beginning her 11th season with us. I can't believe it's been 11 years. Um, Janet is our ears and eyes at the Spring Church. She brings concerns and issues to us. Uh, also, she helps everyone with their events at the Spring Church and, and does it very ably. She cares for that facility as if it were her own. And um, we appreciate that, Janet. She asked me not to tell anyone she was here, but I told her I needed to. Um, Michael, Janet, and I have reviewed the uh, rules for the Spurring Church. We bring before you this evening really some minor technical amendments. Um, in your packet, you did receive our suggestions. I, if you'd like, there's just maybe three uh, notes that I might, might bring to your attention. Uh, one being the fee structure. We have simplified the fee structure to still include a resident and non-resident fee. We would recommend an increase in the resident fee from 175 to 200 and on the non-resident fee 275 to 300. We have also clarified um, the definition of a resident and we have added the language for the use of the facility to fall into the resident definition for a funeral or memorial service or a christening. And just the last thing that I would point out is we have simplified the cancellation policy. Um, the majority of events at the Spurling Church are weddings and those are generally scheduled a year in advance. What we are suggesting is that for any event that is scheduled at the church if the cancellation is six months or more, they would forfeit the $50 security deposit. However, if the event is less than six months, we would recommend that they would forfeit any rental fees in the security deposit. Again, the reason being for Janet or the town to be able to reschedule an event with less than six months notice, highly unlikely that that would happen. Um, I can tell you in the last few years that there have been uh, several cancellations of the church for various reasons. And frankly, some of those reasons being that um, because it uh, wasn't a, a huge financial burden to cancel the reservation, some folks kind of had the church on hold for if they needed it, um, you know, that type of thing. So we, we want to avoid that. We want to make sure that uh, those folks that want to use the church that is available for them. So again, just to clarify and simplify the cancellation policy, uh, we believe at this time would be appropriate. So with that, we would uh, recommend approval of the, of the uh, amendments. Questions for our assistant town manager, Councilor Lynch. I didn't have questions. I was going to make a motion. Okay, well, let's make the motion. And if anybody has a question during discussion, We'll get it answered. Okay. Um, I would move amendment to the um, provisions for the use of Spurwing Church as more fully set out in our package. Second. Motion and second. Discussion or questions for Ms. Lane? Councilor Fritz. I just had one question concerning the security deposit and whether um, we've ever had any damage by anybody who had rented the church and whether 
50 was actually, does, would that cover anything that at least has happened in the past? I remember, was it one instance or a couple, and it was more a cleanup rather than damage. Um, certain times of the year, things are brought into the church and, you know, on people's feet and so forth. And the cases that I'm remembering, um, it was really a lot of additional work to clean the church, to prepare it for the next folks. And, it, in, and again, Mrs. Hannigan takes care of that facility as if it were her own and, and does a lot really probably above and beyond. But these couple situations were, were really beyond. And, and so we kept the deposit in, in the 50-day cover. It's really not appropriate for rice in the church because one Janet has to clean up and they also attract Janet's favorite mice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I think you said at the end that $50 did cover. That yes, it did in that instance. Cleaning. Mm -hmm. oh. Council Moles. Thank you. And I did want to say that in general, I'm opposed to any increases in fees. However, in this particular instance where you're really still probably below what it would cost you to rent any comparable place, well below renting, you know, a serious, you know, function hall, then I'm, I'm really not opposed to bringing these fees a little bit more in line with, with where they should be. And considering that we, it is an expensive building to maintain and we do have some work coming up on the building, there's a committee looking at that, I am in favor of uh, this amendment. And just uh, so you'll know, 1999 was the last time the fees were increased. I did some research in the, in the town records, so. It's a long time. Thank you, Deborah. You're welcome. All those in favor of the motion? The motion is approved, seven in favor, zero opposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to our greeter for the excellent job done. And thank you for coming tonight. Okay. Item number 37-2006, executive sessions. May I have a motion? Councilor swift Kayata. I'm Before you make that motion, do you want to do our citizens, last chance for citizens to say anything if we're going to leave the room? We probably should. Should be directed to the chair, yes. We probably should, thank you. Uh, once again, we are at the point on the agenda where there is an opportunity for citizens to address the council on matters that were not on our agenda. If you would tell us your name and address, please. My name is Ann Pokris. I'm at 79 Bowery Beach Road. Uh, please interrupt me if this has already been brought up, but it has to do with roads going through new neighborhoods. Uh, I understand that there's a controversy about <clears throat> having access for emergency vehicles and double uh, egress and that sort of thing. That, that was not on our agenda tonight, so you're so, welcome so it's to address Okay, is there some way that I can make sure that this suggestion I have comes forward to the whole? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, would you? You're saying this is, so this is, this is the appropriate yes, venue? Yes, this is an appropriate yeah. okay. time. <clears throat> anyway, if you've heard of this before, um, just let me know. There is uh, a structure that I have seen before that is not a speed bump, uh, but it actually is a cement structure that has either indentations or cuts in it where if vehicles need to get in or out, that is not just normal traffic and emergency vehicles can go through. But this is a very obvious structure uh, and there's a sign that indicates it's not for regular traffic use. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. If it's something that has not been brought up that you might be interested in looking into that. Uh, I'm not sure if it is technically Bethesda, Maryland or Kensington, but I saw a few of those and it's a pretty heavily populated area, but uh, it seemed to be pretty effective. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Council Moles. So are these uh, gaps in the concrete right about the same as the wheelbase? It's actually all the way across. It's raised. Uh, now this goes back to, <clears throat> see I was in the police department in the early 80s. Uh, it's raised maybe a number of inches. Uh, and it's, it's, it's angled so it's not sharp. 
it's angled, but then there are pieces that would make it rather difficult. Certainly there would be people who... It's like a raised table with corrugations? Mm -hmm. And it was cement. Uh, so it wouldn't necessarily damage a vehicle, certainly if it was going a uh, regular car. Uh, it might do a little something, but it certainly gained someone's attention. So if people needed to get in and out, they certainly could. So I just wanted to bring it up as a, as a possible something interesting for the future if, as people look at different brainstorming ideas. Thank you. And would you spell your last name for us, please? <laughs> P as in Paul, O-K-R-A-S. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Just if I might respond briefly. The, I happen to have as an acquaintance the manager of Montgomery County, Maryland, with Bruce Romer, and, uh, you know, both, I, I don't know about Kensington, but I know Bethesda is part of uh, Montgomery County government, so I'll send him an email and ask if you could have someone on the staff send us uh, some information on that, so I uh, appreciate that. It's been so long since I've been there, I can't remember the name of the street, but you have my name and address over so If uh, you're not sure, uh, there's only one or two of them that I'm familiar with. Great. But I'd be happy to try to get a little more. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back to item 37-2006, Councilor swift Kayata. Yes, I'd like to move that the um, council, in conformance with 1 MRSA section 405 paragraphs A and D, enter executive session for the purpose of beginning the annual evaluation of the town manager and also to discuss labor contracts. Second. Second. Second, Councilor Lynch. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Discussion on the motion? Snooze, you lose. All those, in, <laughs> all those in favor of the motion? I was snoozing too. <laughs> the motion is approved. Seven in favor, zero opposed. The council will enter executive session. Um, Should we say if it, we anticipate taking any votes? And uh, we um, do not anticipate taking any votes on the matters. Um, um, for which we will be entering executive session. Um, at the end of executive, we, we will leave executive session. We will not be reappearing on camera when we leave executive session. Um, and we will be leaving executive session for the sole purpose of adjourning our town council meeting. Uh, I thought we were going to have a workshop to discuss the Ralph Gould. Thank you. Following executive sessions, the town council may have a workshop discussion to discuss the annual presentation of the Ralph Gould Award, um, which we will do. Um, we will discuss the annual presentation of the Ralph Gould Award, and that discussion will not be on camera, um, although any members of the public are welcome to join us for that discussion. As long as they don't spoil the surprise. Uh, Chairman Backer, I noticed that there's a nice list of meetings for January and February on the back of our packet for tonight. I think the public might want to hear. For upcoming meetings, the Council has a workshop scheduled for this Thursday, January 12 at 7.30 p.m. in the William Jordan Conference Room. Um, do we have an agenda for our the, the workshop this week? Yeah, the primary topic is council goals. Uh, there will also be a manager report on a whole bunch of things. On Monday, January 23, the council has been asked to save that date for a possible workshop at 7.30 p.m. Currently not looking likely, but we didn't want to take it off the schedule yet. On Monday, January 30, the uh, town will hold its annual board and commission orientation um, that will be in the Pond Cove Cafetorium at 6 o'clock p.m. And that takes us to our next month's regular town council, well, actually, we have a town council workshop scheduled for February 9, Thursday, February 9 at 7.30, and our regular town council meeting on Monday, February 13. And that is our upcoming calendar. Ready? Um, did we, did we, we, we voted on entering executive session. Yeah. We did. We will retire to executive session. <laughs> <laughs>